historical climate reconstruction and impacts, combining physical and written evidence. He has published various articles on climate, disease, and animals in human history, co-edited the first major textbook in climate history, and written two monographs, The Climate of Rebellion in the Early Modern Ottoman Empire, Cambridge University Press, 2011, and A Cold Welcome, The Little Ice Age in Europe's Encounter with North America, Harvard University Press, which is in review. With Dagamore Group, he is the co-founder and director of the Climate History Network. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Lee. All right, thank you very much. I am I on the mic? Am I recording properly? Excellent. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be here in Annapolis. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, since I think I have four sessions with you, uh, is that in this one I'll present the really essential basic background to this field, uh, looking first at what is history, and then what is environmental history and the relationship to climate history. Uh, then I'll devote the seminar section that follows to questions of methods and collaboration. The third session, I believe, will be focused on co contemporary applications uh, and how we might apply the past to the present. And then I believe the final session is the uh, public lecture, which will be about uh, research that I'm currently doing and research in my recent book. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. All right, so to start with the biggest question here, uh, what is history? Uh, since I believe what probably makes what I do most different from what most of you do uh, isn't just the numbers or isn't just the method, but the fact that I work essentially with the past. Uh, and not just with the past for the sake of understanding the present, but I work with the past for its own sake, out of an interest in what specifically happened in specific times and places in the past. Now, historians talk a lot about uh, this question, what is history? And I think a lot of it is not so much in the way of giving a specific answer, but in sort of giving a uh, pep talk to other historians uh, and make us feel a bit more passionate about our field. But if I were to offer a attempts at a definition, we could say that history is about the past, or more specifically the human past. Uh, although I put human in parentheses there because it's really more an assumption than an explicit definition of our discipline. And really there is some question among environmental historians whether you could write a work of history that isn't about humans or even includes humans at all. Uh, it's also defined as change over time. Most historians are interested not in just what was or what stayed the same, but how things changed, how things came to be the way that they are. Uh, it is about what actually happened, as opposed to models uh, of the past. The assumption is that if you were to build models or discuss patterns, you would start at least with specific case studies. You would start at least with a specific narrative of what particularly took place in a given uh, location. And finally, it's about narratives. Uh, the ultimate product of all of this is usually to create a narrative, a story even, of what happened uh, in a particular time and place or with a particular group of people. Now, saying what history is, though, is not necessarily the same as answering what it is historians do. Uh, so what do historians do then? Well, what we train in and what we think of ourselves, uh, think of as defining our discipline is, first of all, the discovery and interpretation of historical sources, mostly written sources. And then the critical analysis of those sources, uh, whether we're referring to primary sources, the original voice of history, uh, or secondary sources, that is to say, what other historians, what other scholars have written about those sources. And to do so, uh, we focus on the mastery of relevant information. So a great deal of what we do is sort of strictly empirical in the sense that we are just learning a lot about it, the past, a lot about just essential information about the past. And there's probably more emphasis on simply reading, simply gathering that information and storing that information in our heads uh, than there might be in any other discipline. And that's key because one of our key features in our discipline is contextualization. Uh, as part of that critical analysis of sources, we have to be able to understand where it is that any given piece of the historical record might fit in, uh, both synchronically and diachronically, that is to say, what else was going on in the world at that time 
uh, and also how do we have a longer term perspective on any given event uh, or any given source that we're looking at. So to give an example of this, you would need a historian simply to be able to find and understand what in the world a document like that looks like. And so I'll give you a moment to, to read that here. Um, but uh, this is just one example of many thousands of documents that I looked at to write my first book. It's a document from uh, the Muhime Deftengri, which is a, a certain type of register of documents uh, in the Bashbakarnik archives, which are the uh, archives of the Ottoman Empire uh, held in Istanbul. And I'll get back to this document and why I bring it up uh, a little bit later on. But what sets apart history, as I want to emphasize, is not just that we took the time to learn how you would find and how you would literally read a document like this, but to gather the information, gather the perspective, to know what it's all about, where it fits in, uh, why it might be important. So even for writing about fairly recent events, and even writing based on printed sources in our native languages, um, there is still something, I think, that separates most history from journalism. And I could usually spot a work from a historian as opposed to, say, a work from a non-historian or a journalist, uh, even writing about the same subject. And it goes beyond just the probably bad tendency towards uh, turgid academic prose. Uh, it's really also a, a matter of having a certain insight into where sources come from and how we can use them to construct a more convincing, a more, I guess for want of a better word, reality-based narrative. All right. Now, even answering the question, what do historians do, is not quite the same as answering the question, what have historians done? Because there is probably more that we can do within our discipline than most of our scholars have actually been at work on. Uh, so historians actually spend quite a lot of time answering this question. There are specialists who focus almost entirely on the history of history, and we have a word for that, which is historiography, uh, a word that often applies to the more wider, wide study of history or the body of work about a given historical subject. And I could spend more time on this, but I think for the sake of time here, I'll just mention that you know, there was a really long tradition of trying to look at uh, history writing uh, and various changes in history writing over time. Uh, that could go all the way back to an ancient tradition of chroniclers trying to record the major political events of their times, uh, to new trends in history often associated with the European Enlightenment, uh, focused on uh, you know, contextualizing those big events uh, in their, uh, their time and place, even actually working in a little bit of environmental history. Uh, and then there was a movement towards a professionalization of history, moving away from history simply as a, an art, an art of storytelling in particular, towards more of a formal academic discipline over the uh, mid to late 19th century, uh, especially as history started to occupy its place within research universities in Europe and in America. And oftentimes that professionalization really emphasized the state above all. It, folk, it emphasized that historians were those who would be trained to work with uh, public records, state records, and go into those archives and come up with a definitive record of events that can be reconstructed from those archives. Since the 20th century, though, especially since the mid-20th century, uh, that uh, emphasis within history has, has taken a backseat to various other approaches to history. And I think we can really speak of a fragmentation of the discipline to the point that you can have fairly large departments of historians who uh, actually have very little in common with each other other than that essential commitment uh, to the critical analysis of sources. Uh, historians might be doing all sorts of different work, not only uh, chronologically and regionally, but in terms of what they focus on uh, and how they go about it. So the way to think about what historians have done then is to think about some of these bigger approaches within history, even within uh, historians working on the same time periods or the same places. And just to have a sort of brief schema of that, I would say that some historians are essentially writing history from above. Uh, they write about uh, history from the top down of states, of politics, personalities, ideas, wars. Uh, whereas others are writing history from below, uh, looking at social history, labor history, women's history, trying to bring in other voices that might be missing from that uh, top-down approach and from those official records. 
Likewise, I think there are also two kinds of historians in terms of how they think about their subject matter, whether they are essentially writing individualizing history. In other words, they're asking what makes my particular subject, my country, my time period, uh, the uh, particular group of people that I study different from others? What makes them special? Uh, whereas others might be writing more encompassing history. And here I'm borrowing a term from the historical sociologist Charles Tilley. Uh, those who are really asking, what does my subject say about history writ large? How can I insert my particular area, time period, country, uh, whatever subject it might be, within some more encompassing framework in order to understand the human experience more broadly? There are problems in how historians have often gone about these tasks. Uh, and there are problems in the sort of limits to what historians have placed on their discipline. And I think a lot of this can be understood through what is sometimes referred to as the street lamp effect. Uh, and this comes from an old joke, actually an old meme. And if you follow the history of it, it goes to back probably about the 1920s. Uh, but there's always some version uh, of this, that a man has dropped his keys, he's dropped his wallet, what have you, uh, on a dark street. Uh, and then a policeman comes and finds him looking under a street lamp uh, for that key, for that wallet, whatever it might be. And he says, uh, you know, what are you looking for? And he says, well, you know, I've dropped my keys here. And the policeman says, well, did you drop them around here? And he says, no, I dropped them a block away. The policeman says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm looking here because the light's better, right? And I think we're familiar with this in a lot of disciplines. Uh, but I think it has a particularly powerful effect on history uh, for certain reasons. It's, I think, because historians have especially bright street lamps on otherwise long, empty streets where we could be looking for those lost keys. Uh, some of those street lamps are related to the existing historiography. Very often, historians get into their PhD program, don't know what they want to write about, and you're encouraged from a very early stage to pick your subject to find your research project because it can take so long. And so the tendency is to follow that existing historiography. What does my advisor work on? What's already been written about? How can I insert myself into that debate that's already going on? Missing the entirely new projects, the entirely new debates that haven't happened yet uh, that you could start um, if you are willing to venture away from that historiographical street lamp. Another kind of street lamp, which is also particularly powerful for historians, is to look where there are accessible written sources. Uh, one sure way to uh, you know, plunk out of your PhD program is to say, I'm going to write about this topic because it sounds really cool, and I have no idea where I'm going to find the sources for it. Um, I'm just going to go out there and look, and hopefully they'll turn up. Typically, the sources aren't there. Um, you know, not everybody was writing about everything throughout the past. And to venture out there before you know that the sources exist uh, can lead you into a lot of trouble. That said, though, uh, if you're only going where the sources are very familiar, you're unlikely to come up with something very new. And finally, there's, I think, a third important street lamp here, which has already come up in other, our discussions here, which is the tendency to look for social explanations for social phenomena. Histori among historians, uh, that's not necessarily sort of a dogma of the discipline. I think there's an acceptance that there could be uh, other than social explanations for social phenomena. But it nevertheless is a street lamp in the sense that that's where historians are looking. And if they've been looking there for a while, they're going to have the explanations that they think are already correct, ones based on ideas uh, you know, it, from past generations assuming that social explanations exist for social phenomena, not necessarily environmental explanations or other explanations uh, you know, beyond the usual kind of historians. Finally, there is another bright light uh, that is also pointing the way for a lot of historians as they get into their PhD program. That is the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, which is the single authored monograph that you will write that will get you tenure. Uh, and I say this uh, only in part facetiously, uh, and that is because it really is an overwhelming aspect of our field uh, that in order to uh, finish a PhD, you're expected to have something that is preparation for a book. And in order to get tenure, you're expected to have produced a book, and more particularly, a single authored monograph. That is to say, a book you wrote by yourself uh, that offers some new definitive statement about a subject. And given the exigencies of academic publishing, uh, 
and the expectations for where you're going to publish your book. Uh, this really means that this is going to be your overriding focus for five, six years after you get out of your PhD program. Uh, it typically is what makes or breaks someone's career. Uh, and very often, given the amount of work that this takes, given the amount of time that's involved, uh, it, it you know, is the only major piece of research that a lot of historians write. Uh, later on, they'll never find that they have the time to do that again. And they often find that they don't, but while they don't have the time to do another one, that's all they know how to do. They've never learned to do a different kind of work. Articles have not carried the same weight, so maybe they haven't put much emphasis on writing articles. And because this single authored monograph is what counts, historians have not been socialized into the mechanics of collaboration, which I suspect a lot of you take for granted. Uh, you, you, know, you didn't even necessarily have to have a certain class that tells you how do you start a collaboration. You just saw it going on around you. You started doing it. Um, also, when you're younger, you're starting your PhD program, you have fewer mental blocks, you have fewer habits, and it's easier to do. By the time you've gone through a PhD program and then five more years of trying to get your single authored book published, you've really just lost that talent. Um, you've just lost that innate ability. And it's hard to get started uh, on the next kind of project that might involve a different kind of approach. All right. So, therefore, we can see the kinds of problems that might arise from these, these sort of guiding lights of history, uh, these street lamps, if you will. Uh, new problems will often demand new kinds of perspectives, uh, not just an uh, attempt to deal with the existing historiography. Oftentimes, new kinds of problems will also demand more than written evidence. Uh, it's not enough to simply go where the written sources are, although that's sometimes a good first start. Uh, it might take looking into other insights from other disciplines uh, or evidence from physical records. Uh, furthermore, it's not enough to assume that there's going to be a social explanation for the social phenomenon that you're studying. Uh, humans also interact with an environment, and understanding that environment, understanding those interactions, is often going to give you an important answer, uh, where answers may have been lacking before. And finally, uh, as I think we all are aware of here, there's often going to be a need for collaboration, especially if you are trying to draw on those new kinds of evidence. So that brings me to environmental history. For some, so I'm just going to get a quick drink of water. I'll get back to that. Your peer reviewer uh, for the manuscript. Uh, so uh, just to give some mechanics of the, the, the publishing here, there, the expectation is that an academic press is going to publish your monograph and presumably publish it at a loss, uh, right? There, there's no uh, room for publication subventions usually within history. If they are, they're usually modest uh, with the idea that it's going to help produce a finer looking book or one with more uh, illustrations and maps. Uh, the expectation is really that your book is important enough to its field. It will add enough prestige to an academic press that the academic press is willing to pick it up, probably even though they're going to lose money. Yeah, yeah, essentially. And actually, they're, they're, that, that does exist for some presses. So I, I, think, uh, I think Oxford and Cambridge, for instance, you know, essentially they make their money off of uh, reference books and Bibles. Uh, so, and that, that sort of subsidizes the academic publishing, the two, two of the larger academic publishers, uh, with the assumption that, yes, most of these monographs, they'll get picked up by um, you know, 100, 200 libraries maybe, uh, even at a fairly high price, that usually is a little bit less than what it could be a $10,000 production cost uh, for an academic monograph. Uh, so it's, it's very peculiar. And actually, as book publishing becomes uh, squeezed more by financial pressures, it's less and less sustainable. So even though the potential number of you know, history positions might be increasing as there are more universities, research universities globally, uh, even though the, the range of historical topics might be increasing, the number of new monographs that are likely to be produced is probably about level. I, mean, I don't think it's falling, but I don't think it's increasing much either. Uh, and yet that is a gateway uh, for tenured jobs, typically. Uh, so there, there are two things that don't really, aren't directly related to each other necessarily, but uh, they become related through this peculiar qualification that we assume for tenure. Uh, in most history departments. 
So the, most of the production cost is not in the printing. Uh, it, it's in getting the uh, text editor. It's, it's in you know, actually laying out the pages and, and doing that basic work. Um, so I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I have talked to publishers as, as I was getting other work published. Like in the science literature, you go for science or nature or p and Is it like, oh, if you go with Oxford University Press or Cambridge, you're much better than potentially some other company? Yes. Uh, so certain presses are definitely more prestigious. And also certain series are more prestigious. So there there's, there's isn't just sort of a general hierarchy within history, uh, but really within different historical subdisciplines, there's going to be certain series or presses that are, are more highly valued. Any other questions before I go on? We were just conversing if there are some similarities to economics. Mm -hmm. not, not in the single manuscript, but just differences from other publication processes and other disciplines. Like these guys have punished the co authors for the last one. It's not, it doesn't count. Yeah, as you have many co authors, you have two or three. It's about as much as you get, and it tends to be. Fewer publications at higher quality journals is much better for getting tenure than many more publications or co-authored publications. And as I'll talk about, this isn't necessarily something that has been thought out through, uh, among history departments. In other words, it's not as if we all get together at the American Historical Association, <laughs> you know, or, or sort of major academic body, and say, you know, we really strongly believe that collaboration is bad. Uh, and <laughs> articles are bad, and that you know the, the single authored monograph is the best thing going, right? It, it's one of these strange processes whereby everybody's waiting for somebody else to take the first step. Uh, nobody wants to be the first PhD program to produce a uh, newly minted PhD who isn't on his way or her way to writing that monograph. Uh, and so, and then you know because that's sort of the standard, then when we're bringing somebody up for tenure. Uh, the one way to avoid contentious disputes is to say, well, so-and-so has or has not met this conventional qualification for tenure, uh, which is to produce that uh, monograph in a prestigious academic series. So with that, I'll go ahead and move on to environmental history make sure I have time for this. Um, so I'll start then with, briefly with the background. Environmental history isn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily meant to uh, solve these problems that I mentioned, or, or to be a history directly related to uh, socio-environmental synthesis, as we're talking about here. Environmental history really began with uh, interest in the environment, and especially the environmental movement in the 1970s. It really just started a among historians who were personally and politically interested in environmental topics and environmentalism, and so wanted to write histories in their field that address those issues. And a lot of this began in America, and in particular with a focus on wilderness in the American experience, uh, movements at the frontier, protection of wilderness lands, and the patrimony of federal lands, especially in the American Western experience. So oftentimes, environmental history and Western history were closely intertwined uh, really well into the 1990s, even 2000s. The field became more institutionalized as a distinct subdiscipline uh, with its own major conferences and journals uh, starting around the 1990s and really beginning uh, around the turn of the century, uh, the 2000s I mean, it, environmental history became more and more global. So it, it really grew out of its originally American roots uh, to be something that spread into Europe. There's a major European society of environmental history uh, as well as uh, uh, prevalent as well in, in South Asia, East Asia, uh, to some extent in African history. And very often in those other areas, you already had people who had called themselves historical geographers, had called themselves uh, you know, anthropologists with cultural leanings, who really found themselves also closely aligned with the, the work, the topics, the interests of environmental history. So what is environmental history then? The sort of mantra for the field, as it really became well defined, was that environmental history was history as if nature mattered. In other words, history that paid attention to the environment, to natural forces. In practice, this has meant four different things, uh, not exclusive of each other, but typically environmental historians tend to do one or the other. It could mean the history of environmental ideas, movements, and politics, so the history of environmentalism, 
uh, whether this is you know, ideas going back centuries and the relationship between, say, religions and in the environment, uh, or you know, very contemporary uh, environmental debates. It is also about how natural forces shaped history. So for instance, the history of disease, the history of uh, domesticated animals, uh, you know, the history of natural disasters. Or it can be about how humans have shaped their environments. So the history of land use, the history of pollution, uh, history of water use over time. And I think growing out of these interests, to some extent, uh, environmental history has also started to mean the application of insights of findings from natural sciences to human history. Because very often that's been an essential part of those other three goals of environmental history. And it's created a certain category of specialists. So much like with history in general, asking what environmental history is is not necessarily the same as asking what have environmental historians done, or at least done for the most part. For the most part, environmental historians have still worked with the conventional methods and sources of history. So it's still very much a subdiscipline that's about finding those primary sources, uh, applying the same methods of critical reading analysis and contextualization. Environmental historians have still, by and large, tended to focus on environmental subjects. So if you were to go to a typical meeting of, say, the American Society for Environmental History, most of the panels would still be about uh, national parks. They would still be about water use, dams, uh, natural hazards. Uh, to a growing extent, uh, the urban environment. Uh, some overlap, too, with agricultural history. Um, and by and large, the field is still focused on environmental problems. In other words, pollution, deforestation, uh, disease, uh, and trying to draw parables, if you will, out of the study of those past problems. In other words, looking at what experience someone may have had 50, 100, 200 years ago. And while not trying to draw out a specific policy conclusion from that, saying, look, this is the kind of thing that has happened, the kind of thing we should be aware of in thinking about contemporary problems. That raises the question, then, what else might environmental historians do? And to some extent, what have they started to do? Envi as environmental history has become more well-established, it's also worked its way into other areas of history. And I think that's been crucial because it has helped us also begin to revise conventional narratives. In other words, to look beyond just what, are, what is an environmental subject that we can write about, but what is a subject that people have not thought of as being environmental? What is a subject that people have thought of as being essentially political or economic uh, or social? And does bringing in an environmental perspective actually change that, that narrative? It can also mean, to some extent, and this is, has, has begun, I think actually more so in other countries than in America, to involve a combination of written and physical evidence. In other words, to think about how can we add data, insights to the natural sciences, how can we use you know, physical sources, especially archaeology, and to some extent, this is what archaeologists have been doing for years, uh, to uh, you know, help us understand an issue more holistically than we could just by looking at the written record. And finally, and I think this is the, sort of the next frontier, is that this is history that's going to have to involve more formal and informal collaboration with other disciplines. And by formal collaboration, I mean historians trying to join in uh, with other projects, especially projects related to socio-environmental synthesis, um, but also the kind of informal collaboration that involves from just reading more widely and being willing to show up at other meetings, ask questions, admit your ignorance, um, but also learn just enough so that you can ask a question that you know, is beyond ignorance, uh, that really you know, actually gets you the information that you need. And that's often the most difficult thing. Um, so I'm going to bring up a brief example then from climate history and just to introduce some of my own past work and uh, try to explain that squiggly line that I showed earlier. Okay. So what is climate history? Well, I think I've, I've given it away an important extent. Uh, uh, climate history essentially is two kinds of squiggly lines. Uh, and it's how you put those together to come up with something a little more clear. So the first kind of squiggly line is this kind right here that I showed you earlier. And in particular, this document, what it's actually referring to, um, is a plague among sheep and cattle uh, that struck uh, the Eastern Mediterranean during the late 1590s to early 1600s, which is significant for reasons I'll get to in a moment. 
The other kind of squiggly line uh, might be more familiar to some of you, and that is this kind of squiggly lines we get from paleoclimate reconstruction. Uh, so this is a reconstruction of eastern Mediterranean spring to summer precipitation uh, from tree ring width. Uh, it's one of the earlier examples of this. Uh, there have been many more since then. And I've pointed to some sort of signal years here, particularly 1591 to 95, which was one of the longest continuous droughts uh, in that region for the last several centuries. Okay. So we put those together um, in this way. Basically, climate history it begins with reconstruction from both paleoclimatology, in other words, from physical sources, uh, which usually known as climate proxies, uh, such as tree rings, uh, ice cores, lake bottom sediments. And there's a whole suite of new kinds of climate proxies and methods of analysis. And keeping up with those is sort of a part-time job in and of itself. Um, but also combining that with historical climatology, which is the attempt to reconstruct past climate and uh, climate variability and extreme weather using written sources. Uh, once you have a sense of the climate, you also try to integrate that with broader historical study to understand the impacts of climate variability and change, along with the longer term historical consequences, uh, as well as the contemporary perceptions and knowledge about climate in order to better understand what the written sources really mean. Uh, and from that, you hope to draw out broader uh, insights about vulnerability, resilience, and adaptability. These are both insights, hopefully, for history. In other words, understanding what role climate played in history for its own sake, as well as potentially insights from history. Can we get anything out of studying these past case studies? How this works in practice, um, it can vary. Some people would start with the physical evidence, some people would start with the written evidence, or you just gather what evidence you can as you go. Uh, or you might try to split up the work among different specialists. Uh, the physical evidence I mentioned before can run everything from tree rings to speleothems to lake sediments. Uh, the written evidence can be even more diverse uh, than that, although there are fewer specialists in one type or another. So you might have chronicles you can work with, um, weather journals, which some people kept, uh, some of the earliest examples going back to the 1500s. Oftentimes you're trying to extract information indirectly from such things as tax records or prices. Um, you have various kinds of official documents, uh, and sometimes even descriptive documents that are regular enough that you feel like they give you uh, a fairly continuous description, uh, such as diplomatic dispatches. Uh, and you try to investigate obvious correlations, but you have to set, set those into an understanding of the conditions at the time in order to infer causality. And what is particularly difficult, given that this is you know, so primarily a historical discipline, to try to distinguish the role of climate from other factors. And I think this is what really would distinguish climate history written by a historian, typically from that written by a natural scientist. Uh, the assumption in histor among historians is going to be that still, even if environmental factors play a role, uh, human factors are going to be more important most of the time. Uh, so to really establish that a key role for uh, climate or weather, uh, or like any other environmental factor, in any given case, is going to involve a close enough understanding uh, that you can rule out those other human factors, or at least contextualize them within the broader uh, issue of environmental change that you're studying. Uh, and then in the end, you're still trying to build the best narrative that you can uh, based on the best inferences. So why did I bring up that document before uh, from the Ottoman Empire? Uh, what happened to the Ottomans? To make a long story uh, very short here, Essentially, what I was able to establish uh, when I wrote that first book, The Climate of Rebellion in the Ottoman Empire, uh, was that you did have a particular set of factors uh, leading to Ottoman vulnerability in which uh, that ex climatic extreme uh, made an important impact and really actually changed the history of the Eastern Mediterranean. The Ottoman Empire had started uh, really as a small band of uh, uh, raiders in northwestern Anatolia around 1300 and had expanded to a vast empire uh, occupying 30 present-day countries on three continents by the late 1500s. Along with that growth, though, came particular vulnerabilities. Um, population increased uh, very, fairly rapidly, in fact, more than doubled uh, over the course of the 1500s. And with imperial expansion also came expanding supply lines as the empire tried to draw on 
a wider range, a more spread out range of resources to supply its cities, which were growing very rapidly, and also its military, uh, which uh, you know, involved well over 100,000 soldiers uh, and tens of thousands more uh, in expanding naval fleet. Those expanding supply lines began to suffer increasing problems in the late 1500s, as we can tell from imperial orders and tax records, particularly when there were incidents of extreme weather. And there were a series of recurring regional droughts starting in the 1560s that show up very clearly both in the uh, uh, dendroclimate record, in other words, the, the tree ring record, as well as the historical written record. And oftentimes, when you got those shocks to supply lines, uh, particularly during times of military mobilization, uh, you would see a eruption of banditry in the countryside, especially in central and eastern Anatolia. Banditry. Uh, so there was a especially bad drought that I showed you earlier uh, in the tree ring record from 1591 to 96. And in this case, the written records give us absolutely clear evidence of this, uh, to the point where we have descriptions of wells drying up, of the harvest failing, uh, and <clears throat> in widespread hunger, uh, even uh, rumors of cannibalism in eastern Anatolia. What really made that natural disaster a human disaster as well, though, was the fact that it came at this time of increasing population pressure and pressure on supply lines and a long drawn out war, actually it's sometimes known as the Long War, uh, with the Habsburg Empire on the empire's northwestern frontier. And that began in 1593. Uh, and dragged out for nearly 15 years. So the combination of resource demands uh, for the military mobilization coming on top of this squeeze on resources in the countryside was really instrumental in the outbreak of what's known as the Jalaldi Rebellion, a widespread rural rebellion in Anatolia, uh, which left huge parts of the Anatolian countryside uh, severely depopulated and devastated uh, by the end of the 1600s. And what made this a really interesting case study, uh, beyond you know, the fun of looking at squiggly lines and uh, living for a while in Turkey, was that I was actually able to find a particular tipping point uh, at which uh, rebellion broke out. I was able to find a particular series of events that connected uh, climate and human crisis, uh, which is often hard to do. And I think this is part of why this was a successful monograph among historians because I wasn't just able to show correlation, I was able to show a particular series of events, which is often what constitutes causation uh, among historians. And in this case, what I was able to find was that in the cold, dry weather uh, that the empire was facing, uh, which included some notably severe winters, uh, as well as this prolonged drought, uh, the pasture was drying up, and this helped spread disease among the livestock of the Ottoman Empire, hence that document I showed you earlier. Uh, and in fact, that probably involved an outbreak of rinderpest, a particularly deadly uh, infection among sheep and cattle uh, that was only recently eliminated uh, due to global public health efforts. In uh, up to 9 and 10, or even 19 and 20, of the sheep and cattle over large parts of Anatolia and even the Crimea and the Southern Balkans uh, died out over these years, according to anecdotal reports. At the same time, sheep were actually becoming a key issue in supplying the Ottoman army that was fighting on the Habsburg front. Uh, sheep were sort of the mobile source of protein that were brought up to the soldiers uh, as they were fighting and as they were stationed at their uh, forts on the Habsburg frontier. So the successive sultans of the 1590s were desperate to get more sheep and eventually made a demand for some 200,000 sheep uh, from a particularly poor dry part of south central Anatolia, uh, then known as Keraman. Uh, and it was specifically in response to that tax demand, that un unprecedented demand for 200,000 sheep, that this providence erupted in revolt, and that became the trigger for the more widespread Jalali Rebellion uh, and the devastation it wrecked on the Anatolian countryside. So it wasn't just a question of a correlation, it was a question of actually being able to find that series of events. Now, that was sort of the narrative portion of this, um, but it did actually lead me to a larger scale examination of how social and natural forces fit together. Uh, in other words, the way we could at least schematically draw feedback loops linking uh, climatic change and larger scale human crisis. And really we can see this playing out on both a shorter and a longer time scale. In the short time scale, I was really interested in how this provoked uh, what early modern historians tend to call a mortality crisis. In other words, 
how it was that you got a sudden spike in mortality resulting from a natural human disaster. Uh, and this is sort of a rough schema of how that played out, at least trying to extract that backwards from uh, both the specific Ottoman sources that I was able to find. And again, some of this could be loosely quantified, but much of it is essentially anecdotal, uh, as well as more well-documented case studies from 18th and 19th century Europe, where we have better documented data, uh, excuse me, better, better do documented uh, demography statistics, um, but in some cases, similar conditions. Over the longer term, though, uh, there was also a, a broader shift in land use and population in the Ottoman Empire that I think can be roughly schematized as follows, uh, that as agricultural land was abandoned during conflict, uh, you had a movement of nomadic pastoralism back into farmland, uh, which left farmers who had left abandoned their land temporarily feeling too insecure to move back. Um, as people moved into cities which had higher death rates than the countryside, uh, you had aggravated population loss. Uh, and so uh, that tended to lead to even more abandoned agricultural land and a resurgence of nomadic pastoralism. So in some cases, in places where nomadic pastoralists had been pushed out with population expansion um, over a century before. So by taking both the uh, sort of short-term narrative as well as the longer-term uh, ecological perspective, again, to use that term in a, in a looser way, as we discussed earlier, uh, I was hoping that I could examine, take this as a, an examination of a historical parable, at least, uh, if not a really you know, policy statement, if you will, on vulnerability and resilience, uh, that we could see how population growth in the Ottoman Empire, particularly uh, a agricultural population on more marginal land, land that was semi-arid, that could only grow one crop of winter wheat or barley a year, um, really left a greater vulnerability to climatic uh, uh, vulnerability or change. Uh, also, the way in which, given the poor infrastructure of public health and trade at the time, uh, it was easy for empires to be open to a synergy of famine, disorder, and disease. Uh, and then over the longer term, and this is something that I got much more into into my book, there are also problems related to the relatively higher rates of urbanization in the Ottoman Empire versus many other agrarian empires at the time, uh, which led to a poor control of uh, epidemics and higher death rates uh, of epidemics that could often result either just from the movement of disease vectors, but also the movement of famine refugees. Uh, and then finally, the particular vulnerability in much of central and eastern Anatolia related to that unstable balance between settled agriculture and nomadic pastoralism. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and wrap this up uh, and uh, open up the floor to questions. And then we can hopefully talk more about specifically questions of method and collaboration in history uh, for our next session. I'll leave it to you to call upon people. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I really should have brought more water with me. That's kind of piece of my voice again there. <clears throat> I'll give you some more. Sure. Sam? Yeah. Um, so I know in, in geography, um, environmental determinism is a shibboleth. You know, and, uh, and you mentioned that in your in your chapter uh, with Semple and Huntington. And, and I mean, even Jared Diamond and a lot of geographic circles is considered the devil because an environmental determinist. I don't know if that's the same in, in environmental history. And I'm not saying that your work is deterministic, but just is that something that you have to negotiate within the discipline? Are there calls uh, for avoiding that as much as possible? Because again, because in geography and anthropology, um, if I were to write a proposal, something along those lines, like the first thing I would be critiqued about is like, oh, are you trying to say that there's a link here between climate and uh, you know, your outcome variable or outcome state, you know, and if so, you better be darn well clear that, you know, you're going to come under a line of attack. So just, I'm just curious if, if that exists in history and what sort of negotiation with that is like. Yeah, so it most definitely exists. Uh, no doubt, uh, I got a lot of uh, pushback uh, when I first came up uh, with this proposal and then uh, started actually writing the book and, and even when I published it. Um, but I think there was really a turning point, probably around the mid-2000s, uh, and maybe, maybe late-2000s, 
And I think a lot of that had to do with growing concern over global warming. Uh, the reason being that if people were concerned about what climate change was going to do in the future, how could they pretend it was not an issue in the past, right? I mean, if, if you're concerned that uh, climate is going to cause significant problems for humans, um, that doesn't imply that you think climate is going to determine the future. Uh, you just simply recognize that it's one factor among many and could be a very destabilizing one. Uh, but if you make that admission about the future, why, why not make that admission about the past? Uh, I won't say that everybody is willing to come on board yet. I think it still is a shibboleth among some circles. Uh, this varies a bit by culture, different departments, different institutions. Um, there are some places where obviously I, I really still wouldn't want to be part of the department uh, because people <laughs> have uh, certain prejudices. And I think in large part, it, it is one of those things that people sort of picked up in grad school, especially if they were in, in a PhD program, say in the late 90s, uh, maybe mid 90s especially, during what in the history sometimes referred to as the cultural turn. Uh, a time when it sort of became unfashionable to do quantitative work, it became unfashionable to work on material history as opposed to uh, cultural history. Uh, what, what and I think there's a certain mean? amount of sort of postmodernism uh, to it as well. Uh, I, but that's, that's not, uh, if anything, the fashion has kind of swung back the other way now to the point where someone actually wrote an article in the American Historical Review not long ago talking about a material turn. Uh, you know, away from the cultural turn in history. Uh, that, I have to admit, worries me a little bit too. I don't, I don't want this to be a question of fashion. I want it to be a question of, you know, of facts and intellectual rigor. Uh, I think it is important still to show how and why uh, in environmental factors made a difference. Um, I don't think it's enough even now to say, well, there's a, there's a uh, you know, circumstantial case. Uh, and, and it's enough to say that you know, there's strong correlation. Um, I think part of the work of history is still to be able to tell the story with all the intermediate steps in between and to recognize all the peculiar contingencies that could arise. Um, but in terms of getting a blanket dismissal uh, because the work focuses on environmental factors and environmental causation, uh, that I think is, is a lesser problem than it used to be. That, that's interesting. Um, well, I'm, I'm not at all familiar with that being a problem. Um, I get that like Jared Diamond levels of determinism like, are you know are problematic, but how? What's the root of having people respond and like respond so strongly against saying that environmental factors are causal or have play a role in history? That's <coughs> puzzling to me. Yeah, I mean, it puzzles me a bit too, uh, um, since obviously I don't agree. Uh, but I think in part it's a reaction to excessively deterministic uh, approaches going back to the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, especially those that had a tinge of racism to them. Yeah, uh, that so really you know, talking about you know the Cranny, kinds of people who come from the certain kinds of environments, things like that. Yeah. Okay, but Jared Diamond went so far in that direction. Explain everything in the world. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I, uh, two questions. The first one was when you talked about the physical evidence, it was all related to climate. Is there more collaboration now with environmental historians and people that other types of physical evidence around? So, you talked about getting human nutrition evidence, for example, out of the written component, the written sources, but people might go back and look at like burn densities or charcoal records for burning or perhaps archaeological remains of some of the sheep to see if those were actually started. So sort of to check against physical evidence to check the accuracy of the written stuff. And then second, I was intrigued by the connection on some of your slides to malaria and what that part of the story was. So I have a question. I'll also start with the last one then because I, I think I can answer most briefly. And it, it, that, that is a really good word hypothesis, which is why I put a question mark after it. Uh, it's been an assumption that abandoned land in parts of the Mediterranean uh, can revert to uh, like wetlands uh, if they have been reclaimed wetlands in the first place and that could spread malaria more widely. Uh, it, it's, but the evidence specifically that that happened uh, is, is not strong enough in my opinion. I mean there were certain areas that uh, we know that they were settled in the 16th century 
they were oftentimes resettled in the 19th century. Uh, and as they were being resettled, malaria was a major problem. And so it's thought, well, maybe malaria could have been a barrier to resettlement efforts before the 19th century, uh, because we know certain resettlement efforts did take place, often under uh, imperial guidance. Uh, but showing that they were a barrier, showing that malaria increased after the land was abandoned, and that prevented resettlement, is still uncertain. Um, so that, that's why I leave a question mark there. It's essentially circumstantial. In terms of taking other kinds of physical evidence, uh, yes, I certainly try to, to do that in my work, uh, and I think other environmental historians increasingly are doing that. Um, the different kinds of evidence I've seen used uh, would involve uh, palynology, uh, so looking at uh, you know, land use land cover change based on physical evidence from pollen. Uh, the paleopathology, so uh, this is especially true, I, I think, it, where there's really kind of an interface between history and archaeology, and I think they, they kind of blur at, at a certain point, you know, where environmental history begins and archaeology ends. It's really just a matter of, of emphasis on the continuum, I think, rather than a real strict divide. So others have been interested in looking at uh, changes in diet uh, based on um, you know, changes in, in uh, nitrogen carbon stabilizer ratios. Uh, we're looking for obvious signs of malnutrition, like uh, parotid hyperostosis or enamel hypoplasia, that sort of thing. I'm trying to think of other major use of physical evidence. Um, I mean, it's certainly there. Other types of archaeological evidence are often not high resolution enough or certain enough to get into historical <coughs> record. People really want to know what's happening year by year very often. So <coughs> I assume especially people writing, up, say, about the history of the classical Mediterranean, uh, trying to draw in evidence of, say, erosion from people who you know, try to look at uh, paleosols and try to understand you know, when erosion events may have taken place. But that, that, so far as I know, is still a little less certain. Um, they don't see it showing up as much in work of historians. I'm, I'm drawing a blank temporarily, but, I, but there's definitely more, uh, there are definitely more examples. I've kind of become more specialized in looking at uh, climate and human health impacts. So those are the ones that first come to mind. Uh, so there seems to be a lot of parallels between your work on the Adam Ottoman Empire and the, um, the Syrian Civil War, um, as far as drought and rural dispossession and discontent and stuff. So I wonder um, how much you or historians in general like think about kind of tying work from hundreds of years ago or events from hundreds of years ago to current events and also policy. Like, did people talk to historians about, okay, well, it seems like, you know, you, you're an expert on this historical event and there might be parallels. Can we learn anything for it? Can we do anything about it as far as, um, you know, with the insights that you come from? So that's an excellent question. I was really hoping to, to dedicate the last uh, block of my, my seminars to that um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I, just to give a, a, a brief answer, yes, historians often do think about that a lot. Uh, I think there are some historians who in fact are, are motivated primarily by trying to see if they can you know, bring up something from the past that's relevant to, to policy. That said, they're not all historians are. And I, I went into this project, especially this project on the Ottoman Empire, uh, with no concern whatsoever uh, for what it would have to say about the present. Uh, and I, I'm a little embarrassed to say I, I end that book, uh, which was published in, in 2011, by saying, you know, obviously there's not going to be another Jalali rebellion, um, but you know, uh, it, but it, it's hard to see how much you know how their countries in the Middle East are any better prepared for the shocks of uh, severe drought or climate change. Um, but it is scary, you know, in some respects, how similar the Syrian civil war was uh, to the Ottoman. I mean, to the, the Jalali rebellion, and I can even I can even think about you know specific events happening in the same places. Uh, uh, the, the Syrian city of Raqqa was a, a major center for uh, violence during the Jalali Rebellion, particularly the uh, hard-hit area, uh, even then, and of course now it's the, the capital of ISIS. Uh, so it's, it, it, is, it is scary. Um, I don't want to overdraw the parallels necessarily then. I think it's just as important to see the differences, because oftentimes seeing the differences too uh, can be just as, as crucial in understanding our contemporary vulnerabilities. And, and so I don't want to, you know, bring up those hoary old uh, lines about how the, you know, we're condemned to repeat the past. We're not necessarily condemned to repeat the past, but that said, I think there are insights that are worthwhile uh, helping to guide us in the future. 
Oh, yes. Well, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, my question is, as, as I'm working in, in Mexico, and I often, um, I don't want to say struggle, but think about um, how am I interpreting something that is said and, and done in Spanish, since it's not my native language, um, and how the people that I'm interviewing understand me. Um, so in that context, like when you're first, when you're reading something that is in a foreign language, how do you make sure that you're translating correctly? And especially to s in, in your cases where you're dealing with things that have, I mean, been written a long time ago. So basically to understand, trying to make sure that there, if there is a process in hand that um, makes it easy for you to understand whether or not certain terms have the same meaning as before as they had today. I know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's actually the, the hardest part. Um, so I wish I could say I had an easy answer, that there was a, a way to be sure that you were doing it right, uh, but there, there probably isn't. Um, uh, I think, though, if you're aware of the problem and you've immersed yourself enough in the language, especially the language of the time, if you're writing about the past, then, then gradually you, you become more confident about what people are saying and what it really means in a particular context. I think actually we often have the most trouble where we think that somebody is writing the same language as us um, or think that a word means the same thing, um, where, where there's a sort of deceptive similarity uh, where the differences are more subtle. And, and I, I've certainly had those cases, you know, as I've done my reading and then realized in some cases, you know, quite late that actually you know, a, a particular type of term uh, didn't mean exactly what I thought it meant. I've got to go back and, and you know, revise what I thought I had uh, discovered. Um, but I, I don't think there's any one sure way to do it. Uh, it really just involves a, a, a matter of immersion in uh, the language at the time. And, and that's where there's a certain sort of irreducible human expertise at work, uh, where it's really difficult to it's difficult to share the work, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why we end up writing monographs, because we do rely on that individual expertise. Um, it can become difficult to sort of outsource the work, which may be one reason why we don't have our graduate students or postdocs do as much of that for us, um, and why it's also sometimes just essential to bring in a specialist in a particular field. Uh, I've had the good fortune most of the time to be able to talk with other people who have had some familiarity with the documents that I've been working on, or at least the language that I've been working with, in order to make sure that, that I'm doing things right. Uh, and oftentimes, I started in new areas by trying to find any collections of documents that I could, uh, where there was a translation present or transcription present, to be sure that I was doing things right before I went off on my own, uh, and then just worked straight with the originals. Just on the follow-up, I mean, is something you had said early on about what historians do really struck me in thinking about um, some of the field work, uh, kind of field-based research I do, similar to Matea, uh, which was that the mastery of relevant information was making me think about, and, and the contextualization that I think for folks who do kind of field-based case studies, and particularly in particular communities and regions, there is this aspect to it, which is that contextualization and that mastery of kind of what's, what's happening in that place over time um, and how is that situated. And so I saw a really interesting parallel there. And then it was also making me think of like from kind of more qualitative mixed methods approaches to research, you talk about triangulation when you're talking about understanding evidence. So I was thinking about this piece of, of like micro triangulations, right? Where you're trying to, are, are based on language that's being used or phrases, are you interpreting it correctly? And that you'll potentially be able to triangulate you know, do these mini triangulations through other other interviews, or later on you realize, you know, it helps to reaffirm or to, you know, adjust what your your thoughts were. But I saw some really interesting parallels there. So I, this may be related, it may not. Um, if, could you talk a little bit about <clears throat> how what you think, how you think about what it means to do a um, a critical analysis? Of Text. Um, I, I mean, I have a sense of what that means, but it's not something a biophysical scientist thinks about very much. And how do you do that? Are there methods? Does it vary by discipline? Yeah, so to me, 
uh, uh, well, I guess I should back up and say, so it depends, on, you know, there are different history programs that are going to have different kinds of training in this. Uh, and for instance, at OSU we have a undergraduate course that's introduction to the discipline of history, where usually I'll take a couple courses, a couple class times at least, just to get students to think about, well, how do I read any given primary source? Um, I think the most important thing uh, to make a long story short here <coughs> is remember that when you're reading a historical source, it's not necessarily that the, the content is true or false. What is significant is that this thing was written at a particular moment in time. And so you have to ask yourself who wrote it, uh, what were they thinking, what language were they writing it? In other words, even if you think it's English, what, what was the English at the time? Uh, who were they writing it for? Uh, why did they put it down? Uh, even what was the medium that they were writing with, because that can often define how you would want to write. Um, was in a particular genre? Was it handwritten? Was it printed? People, was it a telegram, a telegram, which has its own writing conventions? Um, so if you can stop and, and sort of internalize each of those questions, uh, then you'll do much better in getting at the significance of that text, um, what it actually tells you about the past. Um, so again, I, th I think it's the most key thing is don't think, is this true or false? But think, what does it mean? What, what evidence is present in knowing that somebody wrote this, you know, in some, in some particular way, for some audience, for some reason? I think you tend to do that with scientific papers too, but we rarely think about it like that. Is there a tension or is there, do you see a division in environmental history or history where you have people who are historians who are writing and they, they sort of have a, a grand narrative, such as Jared Diamond, and they find cases to try to, uh, I don't want to say prove, but, but give substance to that grand narrative, versus people who might be focusing on a, on a, on a certain issue, on a certain place, and, and then is there a reluctance to, to then discern, extrapolate, say that there's some grand narrative that emerges from it? You know, I, I wonder about this sort of case study versus like sort of supra narrative that may exist and whether or not there's some tension or discussion about that in environmental history. Yeah, certainly. So I think there are really two questions to, to look at here uh, and they're probably not unique to history. Uh, one, of course, is confirmation bias, which I think you were getting at first here. And that is an enormous problem among historians because we have very little control on that other than our own personal discipline. You know, if you start by thinking that you have a big idea, a big explanation, you need to be extremely careful that you're not just going to find the evidence supporting it, that you're going to weigh all of the evidence that you have, and you're going to be honest when you, know, you really get a, a mixed picture. Uh, that's especially true because in history, just as in other disciplines, we have that uh, you know, preference for uh, publishing positive rather than negative results. Uh, you know, if I had started by saying, look, there's this huge interesting coincidence here between major drought and major crisis in the Ottoman Empire, but actually if you look really closely, it's just a total coincidence. <laughs> not, 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 not related at all. That, I think, is, is great history too. Uh, and I think there are probably hundreds of cases where, where you, could, you could do that. Um, but those are less likely to get published than the ones where you say, aha, look, I showed through a series of events as well as through you know, broader analysis that drought was you know, a key factor to stabilizing the Ottoman Empire. That gets published more and, and helps get you the, uh, you know, I guess the epithet distinguished uh, you know, in, in lecture series. Um, so, and, you know, it, that, that, that is really going to be problematic, especially for people who are more junior in their career and you know, want to get that book published and get to tenure. But I think once you're more you know, st established, especially, you've really got to be more careful and more honest with yourself. And I think some historians never lose that uh, drive uh, to find the positive result, which can result in confirmation bias, and that's really problematic. The other question is about grand narratives uh, you know, versus, I guess, a sort of particularism. And again, I think there are, there are dangers in, in both, uh, in history as, as it would be in other disciplines. Most historians tend towards the particularizing. They, they don't actually tend towards the grand narrative. And if anything, I think there's often a knee-jerk uh, reaction to condemn grand narratives because mo many historians got into their subject because they were passionate about a particular time or place, especially a particular place. 
uh, whether it's a region of America or it's another country. It, I often had trouble as I was writing my first book um, because people assumed that I had some personal or family connection to Turkey. Uh, and they assumed that I was there because I loved Turkey. Actually, you know, I mean, Turkey's a decent place, but I had no particular connection. And honestly, there are a lot of places I'd rather live other than Turkey. It was, you know, it was fine. I, I liked learning the language, and, and uh, it was a neat place to be. Uh, but really, no, I mean, you know, I would have been just as happy to write something about, you know, uh, you know a dozen other countries, uh, truthfully. Um, it was just where I found a particular uh, historical issue, a particular problem that I wanted to look at in more depth. Uh, and, and now I'm not doing work on Turkey at all. So uh, that, but that, that is just bizarre. That really, some people that just blew their mind in, our, in my profession because they just couldn't see why you would do that. I mean, don't, don't you love your, your country? Yeah, don't you love the place you're studying, your subject? That can be really problematic though. If you assume that your subject is something really great, um, you might not see it uh, for just one example out of many. Uh, maybe even not the most enlightening example. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, again, I think we need to be careful and sort of skew both approaches. As far as the grain narratives go, um, they're, they're, the problem is that we do need grand narratives. Uh, because if you don't have an explicit grand narrative that you can examine, that you can test, what you're probably going to have instead is an implicit grand narrative that you're not examining, you're not testing, that's guiding your work, often without your being explicit uh, and acknowledging it, and it might be a much worse one. Um, the danger, though, is of course that most grand narratives historically have been pretty bad. Can you um, give an example of what you just said? So, uh, I mean, I, well, I guess we'll start with, you know, the, as I said before, the, the assumption that uh, social uh, forces uh, cause social phenomena, right? I mean, that's sort of been an implicit grand narrative in most history. Uh, through your rejection of, say, environmental determinism or climate determinism, uh, sort of, you know, a, a, a blanket dismissal, uh, people have often gone the opposite extreme, which is that somehow, you know, humans have created their own history uh, and without uh, reference to the constraining, uh, you know, forces of nature and resources. So, you know, I think, I think that might be one example. I think if I got into other specific studies, um, I could think of other examples. I guess here's another one. Um, Historians get used to giving explanations, especially sort of textbook explanations for big phenomena, like say, World War I. Um, if I really thought about it, I thought about teaching Western Civ, actually the first course I ever taught, I taught Western Civ at a community college. Um, I, I, could, I could probably come up with about a dozen explanations, direct or indirect, that I gave for World War I. That comes with an implicit grand narrative, which is that World War I had to happen, that it was a likely or definite thing to happen. Now, in, in retrospect, that I don't teach that course, I don't think World War I does have a definite explanation. It probably wasn't even a likely thing to happen. I bet if you could play history out from 1890 to 1920 over and over again, something like World War I wouldn't even happen one in 10 times. Um, but by giving explanations for it, I was coming up with a narrative that Europe was headed towards war for these big structural <coughs> factors, which it could have been totally contingent. Um, so, I think here where we start to see narratives, uh, and perhaps the biggest grand narrative of all that most historians have, as they reject other grand narratives, is that history is just one damn thing after another, right? You know, if every place is special, every time is special, every people is special, um, if there's no big determining factors, well, is history just something that just, just, just happened, right? Um, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe that's an even more problematic one, not to mention that it conflicts with the idea that there are definite causes for big events, like World War I. Um, so, you know, while, while so many grand narratives that have been proposed have been often bad ones, uh, you know, whether it's sort of, you know, grand capitalist narratives or grand Marxist narratives or what have you, um, without trying to create narratives that we can really discuss and test, um, I think we're, we're probably going to even shake your ground. Um, let's see, I think, who have I not called on yet? Have I, um, I called you yet? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I guess I was uh, pretty, yeah, I, I really appreciated the, the talk you gave, and it, yeah, really gave me a, just a great example of just qualitative work and something that I, I feel like I can connect with. Uh, 
in part, I guess I was surprised by some parallels between some of the ways I go about work as an economist and what you do as a historian, which surprised me. Uh, and just sort of this emphasis on kind of digging deep and spending a long time on a topic with this kind of obsession with the causal uh, inference and you know careful reflections on counterfactuals. Uh, and yeah, I'm just curious the extent to which it seems to be pretty strongly something you view is that pretty universal within uh, history is sort of the gold standard to go after. And yeah, what, what you see is the added value of that causal inference versus being able to do more studies faster with uh, correlations. Yeah, so this is something I want to talk about uh, more when we get to the next part of the, this seminar. Uh, I think there is, I'll go ahead and put this in, in a more controversial way so you can get food, food for thought. I think it's really important to be able to explain stories about people that actually happened in as great detail as possible. Um, because I think that people have an innate ability to make interesting, uh, creative, and often correct uh, extrapolations from others' experience, uh, present and past, uh, to uh, both you know, their own experience in the present and other future experiences and scenarios. Um, so providing as much correct detail as possible to have that vivid story in mind uh, with its, its series of causal relations, its, its how one thing followed from another, um, really helps in asking better questions about the present and future and uh, trying to come up with better approaches to studying it, uh, even if the method is going to be very different in the natural or social sciences than it is in history. I'm going to suggest that is it okay if we hold these questions because we're going to come back? Uh, and because we were scheduled for a break, yes, and then we can come back and take up these questions and then uh, go to methods. Is that right? Okay.